So welcome to FACT's webinar called Rotating Your Animals and Your Vegetables, Tips for Managing Fertility, Disease, and Pests, which is presented by Tony Miller of White Feather Organics and hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I also direct our Fund a Farmer project. I'll be moderating the uh, webinar this afternoon. I thank you all very much for joining us. A few quick introductions before we officially get started. Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT is a national nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Chicago, work around the country and promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct FACT's Humane Farming Program and our Fund a Farmer Project, which awards grants and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely in our country. In this webinar, is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our presenter. We are honored to have Tony Miller of White Feather Organics with us today. In 2014, Tony and his wife, Laura, received a Fund a Farmer grant from FACT to upgrade their mobile hen housing. Uh, the grant was used to help them increase the size of their pastures for their layers, their broilers, pigs, geese, and turkeys, and provided funds to extend their electric fence line and bury their water lines. Today, uh, Tony will share his insight about how to integrate crop and animal production while maintaining, uh, managing, excuse me, for a variety of factors, including fertility, disease, and pests on an organic farm. So he will be available to answer your questions later in the webinar. At this point, and without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Tony, virtually speaking, so that he can begin his presentation. Here you go, Tony. Hello. Hello. Hey, you can hear me. All right, great. Um, well, bear with me around. This is my first time doing a webinar, so it is interesting being not having a crowd in front of me. So, but I see some great representation across America here. So this is pretty awesome. Um, yeah, we started in '06. I spent some time. I'll just talk about our history here, obviously. Um, spent some time working on other farms uh, prior to ours for uh, five years. Um, when we went to start, we really were focused mostly on vegetables. We weren't thinking about animals very much on our farm. And as we progressed uh, about two years in, we really felt like, well, we had, we, we felt animals were really going to be an important integration into the farm. So with that, I asked uh, quite a few other friends that had experience what, what would be a good animal for us to start out with. And um, that ended up being the turkey, um, mostly because it has its own very special day. So that was an easy, at least, um, marketing strategy for our integration of animals. Um, but then since then, we've, we've kind of ran through a lot of it. We've raised um, broilers. Um, pigs, we've had um, dairy out here, and beef, um, cattle, uh, we've, we, uh, <laughs> we've kind of messed with it all and settled on what we like the most right now, and that is working with lane hens, um, broilers, and turkeys, and pigs on the farm to integrate with our kind of intensive vegetable system, again, focus more on vegetables, but as we progress, we are working a lot more with both in, in mind. So, um, and as our fertility plans have changed, we've really found ways to try to incorporate animals more within our system um, to help spread fertility. And definitely we've noticed some pest management um, help there as well and, and uh, dealing with uh, special uh, fertility needs. So uh, we'll move forward here. Um, I guess the first thing is it sounds like a lot of you already have animals and um, with your vegetables out there. And so I mean, some of this will be from a newbie perspective, but I think it's important to talk about what kind of animals work good for you. Um, you know, we really kind of move more to having other than the layers, a more annual approach to our animals, just because we really needed, felt we needed that downtime to do um, 
we're still starting from scratch. So we're building buildings and some of the planning we need to do. So annuals, animals is kind of more how we progress. Um, obviously, space limitations can be a factor. Um, you know, how, what kind of animals are you going to work with? Uh, if you're going to work with cattle, you're going to need a lot more space. What kind of plant rotations are you working with? Um, obviously, what are your markets? Uh, you know, how are you going to market these? If you're, we uh, have a heavy CSA focus, so our marketing is pretty easy for us um, through those channels. And of course, like what kind of commitments do you want? I mean, that kind of goes back to what animals, obviously, what commitments are you going to have? Um, you know, what can you afford to do, especially. As if a lot of you are doing vegetables out there, you know how intense it gets at the peak and how can you manage those commitments you've made. And, of course, personality. You know, some people get along with different animals in different ways. So I think that's really something to look at. If there's an animal you're trying to raise that frustrates you uh, and it's in certain ways, you should really consider, um, you know, what ones work best best with your personality and your farm's personality and of course risk um how, is this a little bit better for louder um risk is a is a definitely an issue uh that sounds better that really me. that's better okay um you know risk is something that we're always kind of worrying about if the if the hogs get loose that is not a great thing so we have to really consider how we mediate those and how we you know is it worth it to you um, to raise animals within your vegetable system if you could have a huge viability so something to consider if you haven't already um, this is just kind of an overview to of our farm um, we uh, can you end up seeing my cursor not sure but um, we we have fields laid all around um, our this area where you see the white line, and essentially we're rotating animals in okay in and out of these areas. So essentially, what we're doing is we're having fallow areas. We have broken almost twice as much land than we have in vegetable production, and we're giving fallow time between um, these vegetables and animals. And how we choose the animals and what we follow, we'll talk about a little bit more. But this, this kind of gives you, we have, a, if you will, that tree clump in the middle is kind of a center and I view it as a circle. And we're always rotating things around. So obviously there's fertility and disease and pest reasons for moving a, uh, a crop, but then we also will um, shove in there a, an animal in that field as well. So here, moving on, here's kind of a, what we use for a layout for organic certification maps. Um, you don't see in there, um, I have all those fields are plotted out into acreage and square footage so we can do better planning. But uh, we're moving these plots around and we have these kind of fallow areas in between, if you will, or habitat areas, um, these gardens. Uh, so we're moving, we keep about uh, just under six acres in um, solid vegetable production. Um, we are quite intensive with our vegetable production as well. So uh, we do get a lot out of that. And so if you're going to rotate in these patterns, um, you know, obviously with our land, we have this rolling moraine and kind of awkward tree rows to work with in a way. If you had a really flat field, it could be really, really nice and easy to set up a system that really trades in and out very easily um, in your in your plotting of your field. Uh, we kind of have to work uh, with where we're rotating to. It might even mean sometimes a certain crop is somewhat smaller than the previous year. Um, we, but, um, it, you know, we work with the land we've got, obviously. So something to really think about when you're going to be plotting out these, these plots, uh, if you're going to start rotating more intensely with vegetables, 
um, how how you're going to be moving stuff around. Here's the netting, electric netting. This works really good for our lane hen operation. We like that. Um, works fine for us. I think it works fine for most people. Um, uh, with our hogs, what we do, we've used them in several ways on the farm. When we were breaking new land, we used them for that to kind of burn off some land and put it into vegetable production. So there's one way that you can use use the hogs in your system. Now we currently more so follow with potatoes. Uh, we grow just over a half acre of potatoes, um, sometimes up to an acre depending. Uh, and we've really found hogs for us to work great to follow those. Now I see that, you know, obviously there's people all over the country here, so you're going to have different pests, different issues um, that you'll consider on how possibly an animal will rotate into your system and benefit you. Um, getting to know your pests really well, that can be a big thing. For us, um, following potatoes with hogs, there's a couple purposes. One is to bring the fertility back. The main one is to... Um, do pest management. We have the, the Colorado potato beetle, which is pretty serious pest for us. And if we have rogue plants out there that are continuing the breeding of those and disease, um, blight diseases, that can be obviously a big issue. And using hogs to follow our patch works really great. They go out and find those plants, they find the tubers, and they help us manage and mitigate our potato patch. So that's one way we really like to use the hogs now. Um, there's also a cover crop in there. Uh, we start them out in a, you can see Laura's there with uh, two tapes. Uh, we start them with a smaller product that has uh, two tapes, sometimes three, depending how rambunctious uh, the feeders that we get are. Um, we used to feral sows, but we kind of prefer to just buy um, feeders now just with uh, our vegetable focus and time again. So we start them out in a small area to get them trained to the fence. And meanwhile, the cover crop that is going in the rest of the, the potato, previous year's potato patch is growing. And that gives them a really nice kind of bonus um, feature too to to eat and, and graze on as they go. Now they'll they'll stay in our whole area blocked out for the potatoes for their the whole season until we take them in in November. And we bring them in in around April, so. Yeah, not after harvest. Um, I should probably, I'll field some of these questions later, but I do like getting them while I'm going here. Um, it, they, they will be, entering the the April this April they'll be entering last year's potato harvest. Um there's rye in there right now. Um you know we pulled everything out, seeded rye, and they'll be managing it for this coming season in case there's any rogue plants out there, which there always seems to be. Um so there was just I just wanted to but in there was a question. No one knows. Um, not everyone can see the questions. The question was: So, do you put your hogs on potato har uh, fields after harvest to clean up pests and and left behind potatoes? Um, and that was what Tony was answering. Yeah, yeah, and and that's I, I don't see anything wrong with possibly doing that. I, again, it's just about finding how they work into your system. Um, but for us, we like to move them in the following spring and get a cover crop growing in there that fall. So, um, and they still go through and find those uh, rogue plants that start growing or they'll just find the spuds before they even are growing. So, and it, that brings up, you know, clear boundaries. Um, you know, I always like to say um, it's not if your hogs get out, it's when they get out. So um, we found that, you know, some people, there could be some big concern of them getting into a nice brassica patch or the squash patch. We found, we really like having the hogs around, and uh, we found that they tend to just find people and not really mess with the crops, luckily. I can't say that's always going to happen for everybody. I'm going to look for some wood here to knock on. But, 
this, they've worked great for us. And training them to the fence and making sure that fence is hot, obviously, there's a lot of animal feed here. You, you know that that's critical. You want to keep that with hogs up around 6,000 volts, and we're checking that uh, daily because um, we really don't want those those guys getting out. So, And we'll move on the slide here. Our turkeys, um, we tend to use our turkeys in one paddock the whole year, too. Um, we, we've moved, actually, to a more uh, solid fencing for them. That's just due to um, the kind of – we have dogs that roam in the neighborhood, and that's been kind of an issue that turkeys seem to be way more sought after. But uh, we leave them in a full area, that full paddock or previous garden field, um, for the whole season as a remediation as well. They come in, they get a nice paddock because they come in uh, right around June. Well, they get into the field about July. So um, we're not raising any heritage breeds. Again, for us, we really like to just buy in chicks and then have we butcher them fresh for uh, Thanksgiving. So that's kind of a niche that we can do is have – fresh turkeys for Thanksgiving. And that's that's the animal we start or started out with and we've always really liked. They're great foragers. Um, they really they get after grasshoppers. Um, they can be really good at mediating certain pests. If you have, um, you know, we have cucumber beetles up here. We have several other things. I see some warmer climate folks. I'm sure there's a lot of different pests out there. And, and turkeys are really amazing um, insect foragers, and they they will really clean a field well. So that's something to really consider moving in if you have problems and have the space to do. Uh, and this is, we've raised broilers a lot of different ways. Um, we've really just come back to for several reasons for the animal safety and, and time and profitability to the tractoring model. And one reason we really like having the tractoring model um, for the gardens is I uh, see what they're doing here in this picture is they're, they're moving along our orchard, our young orchard. And uh, you can see brassicas on the other side there. Uh, we can kind of, we have these developed to the size of our beds as well. So if we have an area where we can run these tractors through um, in just a small bed space that prepares for a fall, we find that really helpful. Mostly um, the broilers are a great fertility source for us. Um, we'll, we'll have a, we do a lot of cover cropping and they do a great job of foraging that and littering and that makes a a really great uh, fall carrot, if you will. That's one thing we really like to do with them is prepare land for our fall carrot plantings um, using the tractor method. So, and yeah, so we we raise around 500 boy, broilers. Um, we have 100 turkeys. We do about a dozen hogs. And we have our lane flock of 150. So a little gamut of it all there. And we do all of our butchering of turkeys and the broilers on farm. Um, that works really a couple reasons. Luckily, in Wisconsin, we can do that and when we stay under 1,000 birds. And one reason we like that is the quality of the product we can get to people. We can handle the bird right there. Um, and we get the viscerations, and those viscerations, blood is uh, about 40% nitrogen, and uh, the feathers are um, very, feather meal is a, an additive, so we're, we're breaking those down. It takes a long time to break feathers down, but we're keeping our viscerations on our farm as a fertility um, input as well, and that we do in multiple, we compost that. We use, we're kind of fortunate to have a leaf collection in our local town and then um, someone that grinds, shreds it up. So we bring that in as an organic uh, material. Uh, not everyone will have access to that. I'm sure like straw or hay would work great as your carbon source for breaking these down. But 
Um, animal viscerations are are a very high nitrogen source, so you're going to want a uh, you know a fairly large amount of carbon, uh, around 70% of a carbon ratio with your um, viscerations. And we do that in kind of a layering method and of carbon down, visceration, a layer of visceration, carbon again. Um, again, that can be leaves. That could, it could even be wood chips, but wood chips we found take too long to break down, about three years. Um, so otherwise we get fungal issues with the wood chips in our um, root crops. So we've moved to mostly using the leaves and or hay and straw. Uh, another thing, though, when you do have a visceration pile, I don't know if you have a lot of, if you're, like our situation, snoopy neighboring dogs are probably in, uh, one of the biggest problems we have with our uh, composting method there. So we've then had to come with layering um, about three feet of either finished compost is what I prefer to use. If you have soil, you might want to put some soil on top. They'll just, they can smell that and they'll burrow through and make quite a mess uh, out of your compost pile. So we've, we usually put about three to four feet of finished compost on top of ours. Um, yeah, well, I shouldn't say, feet. yeah, about two feet, I should say, but our piles are as high as five feet high and about four feet wide. So you just need a nice, really strong cap on that so that um, you're not getting stray dogs, if you will, um, messing with your pile in our experience. So probably the biggest question, and you, and you probably see this if you're messing with vegetables a lot, is um, the food safety. Um, issues. And of course, that is a very important thing. I still feel very strongly that animals are a very important part to integrate into a farm. So we've kind of given ourselves um, rules. We make them very clear to any employees. Um, if someone is dealing with the animals, uh, they typically Laura deals with the animals in the morning. If we have someone else do it, we're very clear that um, the clothing you have on cannot then get in contact with packing vegetables or anything like that. So we, you know, making sure that you think about those things. Anything that may bounce back and forth between your animal and your vegetables. So we actually now have a yard carts devoted just to um, animal animals versus vegetables, so we're not having any potential cross-contamination there. Um, I, there's a question here, do you turn the composting visceration? Yes, I do. Um, I wait quite some time, though. Um, we're checking the pile. We will let it heat up, and as soon as you see it cool back down um, with a compost thermometer. Uh, and once you have your basic feed stocks, like for us, again, the we're using pretty much the same type of carbon feed stocks. Um, that timeline is pretty well known. So we, monitoring isn't as important, but in the beginning you want to, you know, monitor your temperatures. So when I start seeing the pile starting to cool down, then we flip it. Um, we do have a skid steer. That's what we use. Um, so because we we do have about almost a thousand yards of compost we manage on the farm as well. So um, from other in streams as well, from a brewery that we use and whatnot. So uh, we do have a skid on site that is very handy. If not, you know, obviously you'll have to find ways to turn that. But turning it is important, getting oxygen back in there to finish breaking it down. Um, but it's amazing within, uh, within a season you can – even break down bones, uh, the, the poultry heads are completely disintegrated. Uh, you know, I'm, it's, uh, if you operate it properly, you can break down distillations within a year, no problem. So. Um, I, again, considering certain people to just deal with the animals, um, I think is something to consider so that there's less contamination between um, the animals and the vegetables. 
can make it a lot simpler. And uh, making a list of things that may go back and forth between places. We we use size for both the vegetable field and the animals. Um, we you know any tools that may bounce back and forth. We make sure that they are clean and and sterilized if that's the case. So I think this is a very important part. If you're going to go back and forth with that, um, having a plan like that is important, especially with the new FACEMA. Um, rules coming through around so and yeah let your animals do the work uh, those compost piles when we have one a compost that's finished and the worms have moved into it uh, one thing we like to do is make piles in the lane hen areas so then then they I can amend certain areas with them. They, they'll they take about two yards and flatten it out in a matter of uh, two or three weeks. So we kind of let them do some compost spreading as well. Um, also, it really fills their instinct nature to scratch and peck. So um, and there's fungus in there that's good for their health. Um, you know, the worms, obviously. So a finished pile ends up going, a well-finished pile, no heat happening in it, um, worms have moved in, is what we give them um, about a pile every month they get. So, And we use them to move that, and we move the hens as a fertility program as well. Typically, our lane hens follow our sweet corn patch just to add a lot more of the nitrogen back in that we need and and help break down the corn residue. So they add a lot of bioactivity there, and then that patch is really great for a fall planting. Uh, that's one way we end up using the lane hens. And then, like, the broiler system that we use it works really great um, for preparing specific beds or areas uh, ready for that season. So some of the uh, considerations, we've really talked about a lot of them. Um, you know, the pest loving, like when you're setting up your field for uh, how you're going to move an animal in or out, we really consider, is there a pest that's giving us a problem and how does that animal or how could that animal uh, mitigate that pest? Um, can it root it out? Will it hunt it at a certain time when it's actually prone to um, merging from the soil, you know, so that's something to think if you have a pest that's a spring pest or a summer pest, and, you know, when are you going to have that animal and what age is that animal going to be when it's in that area that it could do work for you. Uh, the disease, again, too, we've talked about that, how the hogs have actually really helped a lot with our um, white diseases and potato management. Um and again, fertility, we found the more that we've increased our fertility in our land, um, more disease resistant the plants seem to be. So that's another way to look at that. Um, and then following crops that have different fertility needs and what kind of fertility is the animal leaving for you? Um, you know, if, if it's a crop that needs more nitrogen or phosphorus, um, you know, and there's obviously a lot of other nutrients to be thinking about, but uh, poultry manure can be really good with replenishing phosphorus um, and nitrogen. Now we have, we are doing more testing on our soil since we've implemented more of these rotations and tweaked our rotations. So we have, you know, it's kind of an evolving thing. Constantly do soil tests every year and see how you know, where you're headed with the animals you're using. Um, it's it's pretty interesting to see how you can um, prepare a field needs with animals. So um, it's been a work in progress here. <laughs> so, uh, what, and I guess thinking of what crops will come into those fields, what crops will proceed, um, obviously you can look at this a couple ways. We're... And as I've mentioned, you know, we're we're using animals to deal with 
a crop that used to be there, its fertility or its pest problems, but we're also using animals to prepare for the one that's coming in. So it can get pretty complex, your rotations. Um, you can look at them, you know, starting out very simple is probably the best, and then making them more complex as you understand um, your needs with your soil and the needs that you have out of your vegetable crop. So, and again, yeah, do soil tests to see where you're heading. Uh, it's really annual soil tests can really more so just tell you where you're going with your system and what you may need to tweak or do. And enjoying the benefits. So, you know, with good animal fertility and other composting, we have able to really cram our yields out of um, the land. Works quite well for us um, as we've been progressively getting into it now that we're on several years of immigrating animals. And we're, our yields have, um, since the, we started now, almost doubled. So that's it's definitely been a good success for us to integrate these systems. Um, and then again, you know, you're, you're, when you're moving animals in, not only are you still getting a, um, a product, um, something off the land, that, but you're also reducing your tillage, you're fallowing that piece of land, if you will. So areas like where we're going to be moving our lane hens here shortly, um, they'll eventually have a mature rye stand in there that they can be pecking seed away. We're not killing that. Um, you know, we try to work some of our cover crops in a way that there is um, mature seed in there at some point for them too. So you can really think of it a lot of different ways. And, and the reduced tillage is definitely a, a huge advantage um, of giving your field some breaks and yet getting some animals through there. So it's definitely a, well worth it. Um, so just some more pictures of, you know, we are definitely more vegetable based um, with our operation, but the animals have been a really integral part in how we're um, getting what we want um, out of pretty marginal soils. We're in the, the sandy plains of central Wisconsin, so um, we've made some big leaps, uh, you know, working with animals on our land. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe I cruise through it a little fast, but I can answer some questions or we can get some good discussion. Yeah, thank you, Tony, so much. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Larissa again. Um, and we are going to start the q in just a, a, a moment. I do have one last poll for you all, um, if you would vote in just a moment. Um, the question at hand is, after watching this presentation, do you feel more knowledgeable about best practices for rotating animals and vegetables about the same or less knowledgeable? And again, these are <clears throat> blind votes, so we, we won't even really know where, what people are, are saying. just take another minute or so to allow folks the opportunity, but the, it looks like the majority of people are feeling more knowledgeable, which is great, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. So we are um, ready to take your questions. We have probably about, what, Tony, 10 minutes or so? I want to make sure... Uh, that we have a little yeah. bit of time for questions, but I know I don't want <clears throat> to go over too long. Um, so if you would, please type in your questions on the left side of the, the screen, and I will read them aloud so everyone can, can hear them, and then um, Tony will, will answer. So we have a question that, from Jess. How long do you rest your areas after animals before planting vegetables? Um, yeah, that really depends. With, uh, with the hogs, that they get that till November, from April till November, and then we will actually plant a cover crop in there again uh, late. So they pretty much have the run of it the whole season. Now with the poultry, uh, the broilers, and the laying hens, we will actually move them through, and shortly after work 
the soil in and plant. Um, you know, with organic certification, it's uh, there's some rules about if it's above ground crop, um, it needs to be 90 days before that crop comes out, and uh, if it's in ground, it's 180 days. So we try to make sure we follow that um, closely. Um, we actually <laughs> didn't start doing it that close uh, after an animal because we thought the rules were as such as that the crop couldn't go in till it that far, but um, our certifier um, told us that that wasn't the case a few years ago and that it was actually when the, the crop is to be harvested. So that really changed our game and got our fertility um, up a lot quicker. We could sneak animals in, um, you know, a little sooner. So. And I have a question for you, Tony. Um, how did you come up with your sequencing? Was it mostly trial and error? Or was it based on, um, you know, uh, expertise from from other, you know, network farmers? Or um, I know you've been tweaking it along the way, but I'm just curious about um, how you came up with your following, all, you know, all your ordering. Um, yeah, I guess, it, to be honest, it's been more trial and error than anything. Um, yeah, the, the hog, the hogs with the potatoes was, uh, two years ago and, you know, just, it takes a lot of time to implement these really because you, you, you know, you come up with the idea and then you have to really wait a whole nother year to, you know, see the, try it, see the results. So it's been quite a few years. So we've, you know, I'm still learning a lot on where we want the animals and when, um, the turkeys are still kind of messing with learning a bit with them but uh um yeah it's been mostly trial and error on our part um, <laughs> but then also learning uh on what kind of fertility man the manure of the animal actually has so that's been something we've been actually reading more and learning from other resources so and, and there's actually a kind of related question is how do you figure the nutrient contribution of the laying hens in particular um well it's kind of you know we we have a cover crop in there as well so it's um the cover crop is adding in and i look at their they have a good balance of nitrogen and phosphorus now i'm only talking about the primaries here but um I, there's plenty of mass out there. It just depends on how hard you put them on the pasture. If you're leaving them on there to, to the point that they're burning it, you're going to have, you have to kind of watch that. We're putting them out there where it's still green and moving them. And um, we have this rolling moraine, so we have these sandier spots that have poor fertility. So I'll usually put their compost that they scratch and move in these um, poor areas um, so I'm doing like fine-tuning with the fertility but um, I guess that I, I kind of rely on my soil tests um, in the spring to kind of tell me more uh, I couldn't give you the exact readout of what's happening after an animal but um, you know it's uh, the results kind of show so and, how, and another question is how do you deal with the wallows left by by the hogs. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, w one nice thing about the pigs is they pop all the stones out. So we first go through and grab that. And then the wallows, we end up either by hand shovel or, um, you know, my skid steer, I'll, I'll kind of clean an area up that they've made a big mess of. But we try to promote them to wallow in one particular area and then the rest of it's running around so um, we found that if we give them enough space they tend to not make large uh, wallows you know all over if that makes sense and do it in one area where we add water to kind of <laughs> give them water to wallow <laughs> yeah so then we're not you know dealing with wallows all over the field it's typically concentrated so 
we have a question about flies and if you have any advice on flies, are um, turkeys, for example, are they good at controlling fly population or have you found? Um, I have found them with moths and, uh, you know, we, we actually, there's a time of year where we have a real big grasshopper infestation, actually, they'll ruin lettuce um, plantings. And they can really help mitigate that, I've found. And I would imagine they're very fast. I could imagine that they would help with a fly infestation. Um, we do have a small white fly problem with root root crops, root maggots. Um, and, you know, not that I've observed that they've made a huge impact on that. Um, but I know they're capable of definitely catching a fly. So if you were to bring them in in an area, you know that they're the flies are hatching and coming out or, you know, you got to time their, their, the insect uh, degree days. So, um, and do a, we supplement with grains? Yes, we definitely do. And if it's one, one, we definitely have grains in there. We're trying to, you know, with the cover crops and such mitigate how much and help them with more nutritious um, diet, but definitely we are using grains and those grains are converting then again. Um, manure crops for us, so uh, fertility through their manure. So um, we are bringing in grain. We have, and we have one last question I think we can get to is, do you use um, guardian animals to protect your poultry? Uh, uh, we, have, we haven't had too many problems with, we have to electrify netting for the laying hens, and then we have, thanks to fact, we have the automatic door for the poultry um for the layers and that really helps with the hawks and the owls getting them in and out during the twilight um but as far as uh guardian animals we have a big problem with turkeys and we are looking at integrating a dog um, that would stay with the turkeys permanently because we have had like over the years just good years and bad years and uh, all over the board. So we are definitely looking at, we tried geese, guardian geese at one point, and that kind of helped, but uh, we're looking at uh, incorporating a dog now that would stay out there. So how often do you move the layer? The, boy, the broilers move twice a day. The layers are moved. Um, I have a big enough area with netting that we move um, Every other week, we move the actual hutch because uh, the way our hutch is designed, the where they roost, all the manure falls through under the ground. Um, it's wire cage underneath, so so that we're not shoveling much manure, and it's I can move that around and it's depositing. Um, so they they get moved twice, so it's a month that they're in this large area that covers probably. Hmm, a little over an eighth of an acre, and so every month they're getting eh, about an eighth of an acre, I would say, eighth to, yeah, yeah, every month they get about an eighth, yeah. Uh, what do you been reading about? So there's a question, that, we'll take this last question, because I know that um, we're going over a little bit, but what have you um, been reading about what uh, nutrition animal man uh, manure contributes? Animal manure. Yeah, you can find nutrition. Yeah. Uh, to nutrition. Yeah, that's um, you can find a lot of good articles in that in different ATRA. Um, if that people are familiar with ATRA, there's a lot of articles in there that you can sift through and find. Um. You know, it's very, it's, it gets the biologicals going in the soil, too. Um, that's a huge thing. We've got very biologically active soils. The last two years, our soil testing really high in that. And um, I feel com coupled with the, the cover crops, um, you know, we're, our soil is testing better and better every year. So um, I guess it just depends on what animals you're getting. There's definitely articles out there that you can find out a lot more. So. 
Well, thank you so much. Thank, uh, I think that's all the time we have this afternoon. Um, if there are other questions, um, we'll be happy to answer them offline. But a recording of this webinar will be available soon, and it's going to be archived on our website. And I'll also email it to you all, uh, most likely tomorrow. If you would, take just a few minutes after this webinar ends to fill out our survey. You can sign up to receive our um, email updates and sign up for find out about future webinars, scholarships, and grant opportunities. Uh, I'd also like to mention that later in this month, we have another free webinar about raising sheep and goats. I hope you will join us. Um, a very sincere thank you to Tony for your excellent presentation and taking the time to answer all, um, all the questions as they came in. And I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon. We will be in touch soon. Thank you again, Tony. Yeah, yeah have a great season, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye.